Hey there, hi there, ho there, it's me, Bear, Forever DM. How you doing, guys? Welcome to the show. We've got our special guest tonight, Mr. Matt Forbeck, is joining us all the way from the United States of Amerigo Vespuccini. Uh, and he is here, and we are going to be talking about the one, the only, the Marvel Multiverse RPG. We'll talk about other things, too, I'm sure, because that's the nature of the beast. When you get two old men together and they start talking about their favorite things in life, but... The goal is to talk about the Marvel game. Now, there's going to be a special uh, statement I'm going to make for people in the chat tonight, which is keep it civil. Please. If you have negatives you want to talk about, eh, go outside, scream at the cloud, because we're not here to do that tonight. As the regulars know, this channel is about positivity. It's about not being negative. It's about not giving in to the hate. We're not here for hate clicks. We're here to talk about something we like, which is a role-playing game. The Marvel Universe, a lot of us like that, too. I'm more of a DC guy, I will admit, but I still love Marvel, too. Um, Elementals is actually my favorite comic, so I'm actually a Comico guy, I guess, at the end of the day. Uh, but we're here to talk about a game that's been a lot of fun to play, test, and uh, is going to be coming out. So, Matt, welcome aboard. Nice to have you back. This is your third time with us, right? Yeah, Bear, thanks for having me back again. I appreciate it. It's always fun. Yeah, you're becoming a regular, man. I'm going to have to get you in the Z-Nut shirt to get made. I'm going to have to send one to you so you can be a Z-Nut. There we go. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind that at all. That would be a good thing. I think it's, uh, it's nice to have Marvel finally say, yeah, you're allowed to go out and talk about the game a little bit. So, Amen. Uh, I've been doing this. You know, They do official press stuff, and for that, they usually have somebody in the room with me or in a chat room with me and, uh, to make sure I'm not doing anything terrible. But it's nice for them to say finally that they, we've gotten to a point where they trust us. Right, right, so, right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Well, I'm going to apologize for everybody. Also, I'm a bit under the weather today. Got a, picked up a bit of a bug somewhere, so I'm really, really run down. So I might not be as animated as I normally am, but I'll try my hardest. But if I spend too much energy, I might pass out in the middle of the interview and have to get one of you guys in the chat to take over. So let's try not to do that. I'm going to say quick that hellos to Chris. <laughs> yeah, be, that would be interesting. Uh, Chris, Stephen, KB, Jason, Tim, how y'all doing? And Steven. So we got two Stevens. We got Stephen Heller and Stephen Watson. Welcome to the chat, guys. If you have questions for Matt, please enter them in the chat. We'll try and get to all of them if we can, time permitting and attention spans permitting, because it is out of the corner of my eye that I notice this stuff. And normally we have a couple more people in here. So there's always someone watching the chat tonight. It's just me and Matt. We'll see where it goes. So, Matt, we're going to start with the big news. You just released update 1.2 of the playtest, and it was a pretty yeah. massive overhaul. It was, uh, and I'm really happy we got to do this. We, uh, you know, from the beginning, people are like, well, there's this problem, this problem, this problem. And we were listening. We had a, we had a lot of great feedback. The feedback form that we had for the playtest rulebook, we got thousands, if not tens of thousands, responses, right? Um, and fortunately, we, you know, uh, we actually have a guy, Amir Osman, who's in the office, who's been hired by Marvel, who gets to go through all this stuff and boil it down for me so I don't have to go through every one of the things individually, um, which is nice. But it's also great because, you know, uh, when you when you get feedback, a lot of times these days, you listen to people on the Internet, and mostly it's the loudest voices that get paid attention to, right? Sure. But instead with something like this, you could say, well, we got, you know, 10,000 responses or whatever it is. And out of those, 70% are positive and they're like this. Right. Mm -hmm. And we've got 5% are negative and they're like this, and this is what they're about. And some of them are cranks and some of them have got really good points. Right. So we take the time to try to listen to people who have really good points. And we also know there are some people bless their hearts. They're going to just buy a Marvel game because it's a Marvel game. Right. And they're not terribly worried about if the rules work or however, you know, we're trying to do a quality job. So we want to make sure that we're going out and making the best game that we can. Right. Well, so, yeah. you know, in between uh, the, uh, release and then the first update was really just here's a few things we want to tweak we're going to see what happens if we just pull one of the levers a little gently and then the second update I was like you know what uh, we're running out of time here to actually do this stuff before we actually come out with the game sure. let's just pull on a bunch of levers and see what the hell happens uh, especially the ones I was pretty confident that we wanted to change and then we had done a bunch of private play testing as well we ran a bunch of sessions at Comic Con and you know, uh, you know at home and such too uh, and I'm like, well, I think these rules are working pretty well here. So let's try this. Uh, and it's fun because you know, I'm really happy we did a play test, right? Because it's one of those things where you're like, now I've been playing this game a lot and there are parts of it that irritate me personally. And if they're going to irritate me and I got to play this for the rest of my life, this is my chance to change them before they go out and be the final thing. So sure. Uh, thank you to everybody who came out with feedback and everybody who took the time to play the game and give feedback on it and that, uh, you know, whether it was, uh, 
you know, praiseworthy or, or giving us a hard time either way. I really appreciate it. Well, and that's the thing, right? Like, I mean, I, I know I filled out a couple of those uh, play test things myself uh, because it, it's a, it's a, look, it's a good game. You, you've got something, there's gold here. Yeah. It was just polishing and getting the tarnish off and getting, you know, whatever is needed to get that shining thing out. Now I'm going to say 1.2 to address all my concerns. No, no absolutely I not. Totally understand. It's a, big pool of people and you did get rid of the one thing i did like which was the archetypes i was like i like the archetypes oh man yeah, you know to me the archetypes were this thing where as i was building character after character after character i'm like you know there's not there's some difference between them but they they did a couple of things one is that they complicate things drastically right sure. there's enough ways to differentiate characters just by uh, choosing traits and choosing powers and choosing different abilities that adding in the classes seemed to make it another layer that we didn't need right fair enough and the other part about it was that uh, the math in the game is because we're using a, a 3D6 and it's got a bell curve in it, uh, you know, just little bits of adjustment in the math actually make huge differences. In things, Absolutely. Right? So uh, it's not like a D20 where it's a flat curve and you have to worry about, you know, it's only 5% chance each way. You start right. making these things, they, ju they jump like crazy. And the math for, uh, for, for the archetypes was often to the point where, uh, you know, especially at the higher ranks, you would end up with something where, Somebody even of the same rank, if they had not, if they're on the slow progression for one type of a stat and a fast progression for another kind of stat, these guys couldn't hit each other. Not even close, yep. right? Yep. And not, it wasn't even like, you know, uh, if you had these numbers, it was like there was not a prayer of doing it. And to me, there's just a way to simplify that was to, you know, collapse the ranks down, get rid of the archetypes. It may still have some issues. I'll admit to that. We're still looking at that kind of stuff, trying to make sure the math adds up for everything. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, the math doesn't always have to, have to add up to allow everybody to hit everybody. I don't think, you know, that Ant Bay should be able to clock Galactus, for no. Instance, no matter what the role is, right? No, no, no. Um, so that's part of the argument, too. You know, obviously, if we get in the ballpark and we get to the point where people are just like, you know, I think this thing should be better. I mean, that's just how comic book and game fans have been for freaking ever, right? Who's going to win, Thor or Hulk? I mean, hell, they're doing that in the comics all the time, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, listen, we're at a point in time where we have as many okay. superhero uh, games on the market yeah. as we have BX clones at this point in time. You know what I, I mean? I'm happy to be a, uh, have the game be a topic of conversation, right? Sure. As long as it's a conversation about this is cool, what can we do to make it better, as opposed to, ah, they screwed it up and we're not going to play it. I, I want people to play it, right? I want people to enjoy it. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think we're getting into that that area for most people there are gonna be some people we're not gonna make everybody happy some people are gonna say well i'd rather stick with champions or mutants and masterminds or you know the last dc universe game or whatever more power to you right i yeah. love all those games too i played them myself uh and this is not gonna be the the game for everybody no game is no. so what we're gonna try to do is make it a game that we think we're gonna have a lot of fun with and we hope the rest of y'all come along with us well, you know what? And that's the best attitude you can take moving forward with it. Like I said, we have more superhero games than we have BX clones right now. I mean, yeah, exactly. the market is saturated with superhero games. And so I've decided to throw one into the market too. Why not? Let's have fun with it. Uh, but the point is, is that you guys really did listen. And yeah. that was a really cool thing because the maths, you know, hate to use the term, but they were broken. And, yeah. you know, Spider-Man wasn't Spider-Man as far as we could all see. We were like, why isn't Spider-Man behaving like Spider-Man? Why is Hulk able to just tank Spider-Man in this system? Uh, you know, we've seen enough comics where Spidey just drives, you know, out of the way, out of the way, bounce, 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 bounce. But right. at the same time, you included this fantastic mechanic where Spidey's quipping actually has an in-game mechanical effect. And I think that's right. just a fantastic thing to do. That brings it more to the genre. It makes it more interesting. So I'd say right now, from what I've seen, the maths are 90% fixed. There's still a little bit of, you know, tweaking, obviously, on the numbers that need to be done. Overall, the game looks good at this point in time. And I could say my greatest complaint is I need more. I want to see more. I have, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I don't want to wait till next year, man. I want it now. I want to start playing this game now. Because even with the version one, that we were playing, we loved it. We absolutely enjoyed it. We had a great time. So for us, it can only get better as it goes along. Now, let's see. We got some questions. Sure. In order to alleviate the God stat dilemma of agility slash, I think it's supposed to be slash might, uh, I mostly want to know if there's a way to swat shrunk small characters better like area of effects. Yeah, so that's something. So there are no area of effect rules right now from what we've got in the play. Correct. Were there, well, there are a couple powers that do that kind of stuff, right? Yes. Um, but, you know, some of them actually, I don't even know if we published yet. There are some powers that do that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, that would obviously, if you're doing an area of effect thing, it's not going to worry about size or whatever. You're going to be able to smack an entire 
group of people or whatever, uh, or anything in between them or whatever size they happen to be. Um, so what's the question exactly there? So I know I'm answering. The so right the question, question is, is, is there a generic area of effect type of rule coming in the sense of if I don't have a power that's an area of effect, but let's say I have a grenade or I have a, you know, I want to throw a car at a crowd of goons or something like that. Right, is right, there right. a way to do area of effect? That's a good question. I'll have to think about that. There's not one at the moment. I'll admit to that. Um, okay. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't be coming up with one. One of the things I haven't really done too much with in the game because it's more centered on individual characters beating the crap out of each other is a lot of weaponry. And I don't want to turn this into a gun nut game. I've done mm -hmm. gun, gun, gun nut games right in the past. Uh, when you work on Western games, it's all about guns at a certain level, uh, you know, for you doing Old West stuff. But uh, for superheroes, it's less about guns. And, you know, honestly, Marvel doesn't really want us concentrating on like, What's a better platform for your pistol or your or your assault rifle or whatever? Sure, you know it's a gun is a gun and you're firing it. But really, what we're concerned about is Cyclops blasting people and Wolverine with the claws and everything else. So, um, so yeah, area effect stuff that doesn't happen too often in the comics, right? It's not like you usually throw something down and it affects everybody. Although we do have a webbing power that Spider-Man uses, for instance, that covers a great ter a great amount of territory. It's kind of an area effect thing. Probably it's going to end up being on a uh, a power by power or weapon by weapon basis, but okay. there should be a basic philosophy behind it. One of the things I am coming up with that's going to be uh, in the uh, in the final rules, we're going to be doing this thing called maneuvers, essentially, okay. which can be part of combat, cool. right? So you notice that there's two things in the combat chapter already, which are uh, interposition and skulk, which are two things that anybody can do. Originally, when we first had a play test before it even became public, those were powers. And they were like low level, like, you know, a Hydra agent will take skulk, right? So they sure. can hide behind people or whatever but it didn't really make sense as a power and should be the kind of thing that anybody can do so uh we will have things that you'll be able to do that anybody can do like i think fastball special we're probably going to turn into a maneuver as opposed to a power right? yeah it doesn't make a ton of sense as a power right if somebody throws you or if you're ant-man riding on hawkeye's arrow or whatever you know it's really just a reaction you do when somebody moves you right so yeah. that'll be a maneuver that we'll put in there that'll be part of the combat section as opposed to a power that you can okay do. All right. And we'll be able to do stuff like that for grenades or throwing a net or something like that, uh, that, you know, we'll try to put as many as we can. Hopefully there'll be enough of a framework. Part of doing a role-playing game, of course, is too, that you can't cover everything, right? Of course But not. you want to be able, be able to have a uh, flexible enough framework that people can intuitively make up things to add on to that, or we can add on to it later. We're not trying yeah. to do a game where we're saying, you know, you have to buy every book that comes out because it's going to have new stuff in it that you otherwise can't get. There will be new characters in a lot of these books, right? Because obviously we can't cover Marvel's, you know, 30,000 characters in one book. But I want to give people a framework where they can actually step up and say, well, this is how this kind of thing works. And this is something similar to that. So this is probably going to work like that. And the game master, the narrator can just make a, a ruling on the fly for a lot of that stuff. And then, you know, that's the old school mentality, right? Rulings over rules. Uh, okay, so the next question is, might and agility can become god stats based on the way the combat works? And we know we're, we're dealing with Marvel, M-A-R-V-E-L. But is there going to be an ability if we want to house rule it ourselves, since we're pretty sure no one's going to want to do it at Marvel's, to put the S on the end, call it strike, call it skirmish, and make it like fighting was in the phase rip? Right. Uh, the might stat is supposed to be in that. It's supposed to be that direction, to be honest with you. I know it came across as just strength originally, right? Sure. Um, but if you look at 1.2, it's more of a fighting stat. And then we have things like super strength, which actually don't add to your might anymore, but they'll add to the amount of damage that you do. Okay. Right? Uh, in fact, I think there was a 1.2.1 that came out. So maybe not everybody's aware of that, but if you go and check it out right now, there's, uh, uh the super strength, for instance, uh, now it's super strong. If you get that, instead of adding to your damage it actually adds on to your damage multiplier. So it's not a flat okay. bonus, right? So, right. Uh, it used to be it was a plus five or a plus 10 or whatever. Now it's a plus one to your multiplier per level that you're going up, right? So okay. you're super strong of four and you're rank six characters, suddenly you're doing a 10 times multiplier instead of a six times multiplier, right? Okay. So, uh, but that's that means that, that that's a power that adds on and shows what super strength can do for something as far as increasing damage, but it doesn't make you a better fighter. It doesn't mm -hmm. actually add on to your might so to speak, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So your might so, there is, is essentially meant to be a fighting stat, right? Okay. So, you know, Captain America is going to have a great might. The Black Panther have a great might. Uh, Reed Richards probably will not have a great might, you know, because, <laughs> hey, you know, it doesn't matter how strong he is or whatever you can do or how flexible, but that's sure. not his thing, you know? Uh, I think also as we, you'll see as we come out with more power sets that don't focus entirely on fighting or at least not physical fighting, like when we get into psionics with telepathy and telekinesis and magic, 
that a lot of that stuff is going to end up being, that's going to balance out the stats a little bit more. Uh, when we did 1.2, I went through and looked at the stats and said, okay, now fighting is always might. Shooting is always, range combat is always agility. Uh, and then we have uh, the two stats that basically do your uh, health and your um, and your focus, right? So yeah. we have uh, the R and the V become your health and your focus, right? Resistance and, and vigilance. And then ego and logic are going to be essentially uh, the same kind of things for fight and agility, but are for might and agility, but for psy psionics and magic. Right. Okay. Right. So each one of those is going to have their own thing. And the funny part about that is people will say, well, you know, that's going to be broken as soon as you toss in the, uh, the psionic stuff. You're going to have people who are weak, but, you know, manage to blast your brain apart. I'm like, yeah, well, that's welcome to Professor X. Yeah. yeah. Have, have, you, have you read comics? Yeah, exactly. Magneto can't fight for shit, but his magnetism will mess you up. You know? exactly. I mean, there's a reason why he is, he can solo the X Men sometimes. You know, exactly. I mean, people forget that. People, I think people get so sucked into the mechanics and the tactical aspect of things, they often forget superheroes break the rules. You can't use squad leader tactics to represent the Avengers. You know what I mean? Exactly. It's not, it right. breaks down. Yeah, Storm comes in. Storm's, you know, Storm's pretty good in a fight, but Storm's not very powerful in a no. in a punching match. Uh, you know, she's a great knife fighter from her days on the streets of Cairo sure. when she was young. And when but she was a real thing is coming in, you know, flying in with a storm behind her, literally, and then blasting down everybody with lightning bolts. That's the kind of stuff that doesn't show up on your might or your agility stat. Right. Yeah, absolutely. All right, next question. Uh, we answered the might question, so we're good. Uh, simple, e simple, easy action removal. Since uh, dyslexia, I have it. Since easy action removal, how do we keep reins on multiple easy action powers? Can we just launch a bunch at once? Easy action powers are all going to become action powers or maintain powers, right? They're not going to okay. be. So uh, it, essentially, if there's something that's easy, it's something that's not going to have any kind of a role to it, whatever. And if they're really the kind of thing that you can use use all the time, they're going to become permanents. Right. Okay. So, uh, the idea was to try to ease the the action economy a little bit, so you're doing less micromanaging of things and saying, okay, I'm doing an action, I'm doing a move, and I have a reaction if something goes wrong, right? Right. And that's yeah. it. Right. It's a simple action economy. So the easy's right. gone, which is good in yeah. its own way. So it either becomes a free action or it gets upgraded yeah. to a. So a, a part of my job is going through all the different powers and saying, okay, that wasn't easy before. Now that what the hell are we doing with it? Right. Um, Patience will get there. Uh, I, I realize now because of the, this is one of the things I was talking about. Once you start moving one lever on a game, the yep. other pieces of it start to fall apart, right? Mm -hmm. You get everything finely tuned for a moment for what you're trying to do. And then you're just like, well, I don't like how it's running. It still sounds like it's knocking. So I'm going to push this one. And then the wheels start falling off over here, right? So you get enough. You really got to try to do it all at once. And because we're live play testing a game in front of thousands of people, <laughs> it's. It's a big mess sometimes. Okay. You might notice the blemishes. Exactly. That's, okay. uh, that's, that's intended to be that way. It's okay. Well, that's the point of a play test. Uh, Ken and Ann Whitson ask, will there be a way to differentiate between actual strength and fighting skill from the might stat to see the difference between skilled fighters and brawler types as skill or talent, to which Tim Kirk says they do have the martial arts power, which is yep. a start. Yep. Will there be a brawling power set for those who aren't martial artists, but they're just, you know, uh, the, the wrecking crew, you know? Well, I think if you're the martial arts power set is actually pretty broad, right? It's got something where if you're like uh, Shang Chi and you're actually you know like level four, level rank four, level rank five, mm -hmm. you can walk in and have almost all of them, right? But if you got somebody who's just a street tough, they might only have a couple of those powers, right? If you got somebody who's like the wrecking crew, they might only concentrate on the attack side of it, and not worry about the defense side of it. Sure. So I think that's well where a lot of that's going to fall under as far as like different brawling powers. Okay. Uh, you know, some of the things we have to look at, and I'm looking at right now, is whether or not we actually do a separate set of powers for Hawkeye, for instance, as opposed to the Punisher, right? You know, if it's a ranged weapon, do we care so much if it's a, a gun or an arrow, right? Uh, and do we, is it really worth our time and worth the player's time to actually have the cognitive load about, am I worrying about firing an arrow? Am I worrying about uh, throwing things like Bullseye does, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <clears throat> or do we try to put that all under an umbrella and make it so that's a little bit more flexible, but maybe too many choices for people. Right. So that's part of the thing is do you want to give people like a lot of narrow pathways they can go down or do you want to give them umbrellas they can, they can work under? I, I suspect for things that are, um, that are very generalized, like range combat and, and brawling or martial artistry, we're going to have larger umbrellas for those that you can choose things from. Right. That makes sense. And there'll be some paths that will be pretty obvious for people to go down. Uh, but when there's things like, you know, uh, energy blast, that's going to be more of a different kind of a thing. Then we'll have a separate 
fairly narrow path for you to go down, a narrower tree to go down, so to speak. So. Yeah, no, I, when we were doing our play test, we made an archer using uh, guns and spider powers. Yeah, you know? exactly. And, right. and it worked, it worked yeah. just fine. You know, it was just fine. Nick H. asks, will Alpha Flight make an appearance? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if Jim Zub, my friend Jim Zub, has a way, yes, right? Yeah, um, well, he's Canadian like me, man. Exactly. We're so, proud of him, too. Uh, so. Very, very Canadian guys. Uh, I'm from Wisconsin. I went to school in Michigan. I spent a lot of time in Canada. It's, it's almost I'm, like I'm being a northern Canadian. Dude myself. So yeah. I'm not Canadian, but I'm Canadian adjacent. Listen, <laughs> Upper, Upper Peninsula, Wisconsin, Minnesota, you guys yeah. are almost Canadian. Yeah, but well, we're north of a lot of the, where the population is in Canada anyway. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. You're north of uh, all of Eastern Canada, for God's exactly. sake. Exactly. So uh, okay. I, I would think so. I'm not sure if they're going to be in the first book or not. We, we get about a, we're looking to do about 100 characters in the first book, and maybe 50 in the, in the expansion book, the okay. adventure book. But, you know, those numbers can change a lot. We're not exactly sure. And we're trying to hit some of the big ones. Ideally, what we're going to do is also have like one or two representatives from each uh, major super group like that, like sure. the champions and the Alpha Flight and whatever else. So yeah, it makes sense. Now, how much input is Marvel having on what characters you put in versus what ones you don't put in? Are you guys getting free reign to choose, or are they saying we got to put this guy in? No, Sentry not... has to well, be I mean, there. I'm working with Marvel on a daily basis, right? So in that sense, you know, the, the team that I work with at Marvel, which is not all of Marvel, because Marvel is a massive organization. Uh, the team I work with has a lot of influence on that stuff. But when I turn over a list of them, they're like, yeah, that looks good. But maybe like, for instance, I have one of the guys who was on the cover of, we had Dr. Strange, for instance, who was on the cover of the uh, the adventure book, The Cataclysm of King, Kang that sure. we've already announced, right? And I'm like, well, maybe we should have Dr. Strange in that because he's on the cover. And they're like, no, Dr. Strange is a very, fairly major character. We should have him in the main book. I'm like, okay, fine. Yeah. Um, so discussions are more like that about where the characters should show up, not whether or not they should show up. Right. Makes sense. Um, Makes sense. And yeah, obviously a lot of it is us pulling out and saying, we, we want to do a lot of the major characters people are going to recognize or some of the new ones that are just coming out in film and television these days, like America Chavez is going to be in the adventure book um, at the very least. And then see what we can do with it from there. Uh, and okay. ideally, eventually, we're going to get to everybody's favorite characters. But, you know, there are a lot of characters out there. Any chance we'll get a Gamer's Handbook uh, series like we oh, saw man, for Phase I, love to. I don't think it's going to quite be that way. I mean, I know the original Marvel game did that. I yeah. think uh, it's, what is much more likely is we'll get themed books. We might get a Spider-Verse book. We might get an Avengers book. We might get all these kind of different things like that. Okay. Um, that would show you, like, if you want to run an Avengers game, here's the Avengers and here are your villains that you get to fight against right sure uh and a lot of that might be more concentrated on the villains and the the different things you're fighting as opposed to the main characters because we'll have covered some of those characters in the original books right okay um but you know you also one of the neat things about coming up with or about building all these different characters you can fight with the villains and such is that that's something for the heroes that you create to fight too mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so if you come up with your own original characters but you still want to fight against dr doom or hydra or whoever uh, we'll have that stuff available for you. And that's a little bit more useful from a narrator's point of view. Okay, cool, cool. Keeping going on the questions, we've got, if Hulk has a fantastic might that doesn't seem to make sense, then not a talented fighter at all. But as we said, might isn't a representation of strength. Right. Might is a representation of how effective a fighter you are. And hopefully that'll be made clearer in the final book so people that's can see idea. it and understand. That's good to go. We've so actually not done Hulk stats yet. We did the She-Hulk, but we haven't done the Hulk yet. So Where's the Hulk, man? We've been asked. Someone's I know. Asked well, the Hulk. Well, Where's the Hulk? the Hulk? The Hulk is a little bit special. He means a lot to me. He's one of my oldest favorite characters, right? But Okay. I, I want to. I'm working on ideas about how to work the whole as he gets angrier, he gets stronger bit, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, the Hulk can literally get up to cosmic level powers as he gets angrier. So oh, yes. he's one that he's going to break a whole lot of stuff. So I wasn't so concerned about putting him in the main part of the rules to start with because I want to make sure the rules are solid before we add on somebody who's that particularly special. Well, he's right? a game changer, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, how much damage do pistols do now? The Hydra agents in the included campaign use pistols exclusively for their attacks, but I couldn't find anything in the updated rules. There is something in the updated rules. Again, mm -hmm. that might be in the latest. If you check out and make sure you got the latest, latest version that was downloaded, I know that I put it in there. I don't remember where the heck it is. Off the tech lines. Hold on just a second here. No worries. I can look this stuff up. That's right. the beauty of the internet. Well, I actually have it here. here oh, go. that's the beauty of you being the insider. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Well, no, I have it. I'm actually just looking at what's on the internet right now. Um, oh, actually, I know what it is. I, we changed the ranges and stuff around. Weapons just do uh, whatever your your uh, your uh, whatever your agility role is, right? They okay. Any other thing, right? Now, if you're some pissant who's just you know uh, a shield agent, it's probably not going to do a whole lot of damage. But if you're the Punisher, it's going to do a shitload of damage. 
right? Okay. So weapons work just like they do for anything else. I mean, um, uh, yeah, whether or not that's realistic that a gun in somebody else's hand does 10 times as much damage as somebody else's, I'm not as concerned about that as, as I would be with some other games, right? But for a yeah. game, like literally the Punisher should be able to do boatloads of damage with a rifle that uh, the kid from Hydra is not going to be able to pull off. Right? Exactly. And that makes perfect sense. And then again, it's not a gun game. Right. Uh, Storm is exactly another example of my issue. She's an amazing fighter, but no strength. She should hit all the time, but do little damage. So I'm lost with this system. So again, Rick, I would recommend taking a look at the 1.2 and also waiting if there's any more updates before time comes out to see how that works. Because again, it's moving pieces right now, and that's what the play testing is for. And also, by the way, are we still taking submissions for the feedback, or is that closed oh, yeah. off for please, now? Please turn them in, right? I mean, all the way through 1.2 at the moment. And when 1.3 comes out, which should be hopefully sometime next month, uh, mm -hmm. we'd be happy. We'd love to get more input. I mean, we don't put the stuff out there to ignore what people say about it. Okay. So, Clearly. I mean, come um, on. So if you, if you have any feedback, please, the best way to get it to me is to get it through the Marvel website, right? Part of that's because Marvel's very particular about the legality. So when people uh, like try to send me stuff and I'm like, I can't look at that because there's not a waiver attached to it. They want to make sure their attorneys want to make sure that, if we use something, nobody's going to come up and say, hey, by the way, I gave you that idea, right? The waiver says, I give you this idea free and clear. Please make some yes. use of it, right? Exactly. Which is honestly in the spirit of all playtests that have ever been done in gaming anyway, right? If you sit down and play test a game with a at a convention with somebody and you give feedback about it, the idea is that they're going to improve it based upon your feedback. So Makes there. sense. All right. Stephen Watson says, I am here to kick butt and chew gum, and chewing gum is an easy action. Not anymore. It's a free mm -hmm. action now. Yeah, exactly. Don't have to worry uh, about it. <laughs> uh, Stephen Heller says, will there be rules for generic superheroing, like stopping moving vehicles or catching falling folks? That's going to be some of the stuff we're going to do in the maneuvers, right, that I was mentioning in the combat section. So uh, part of the problem is it's really easy to get bogged down in different stuff like this. Like uh, if you remember in the playtest book, there's rules for um, knockback being knocked through web walls and windows and such like that. Because originally when I, we were designing this stuff, my co-designer was a guy who's done a lot of video games. He's like, let's talk about destructive environments, right? Um, and so there's a lot of that in there. Now, the trouble is, of course, that these are kind of esoteric things for most players, right? Right. You, you're not, you're not going to worry about every game session and sit down whether or not uh, your character is getting knocked back through three walls or four. Right. Right. Is that, is that really going to matter too much to you? But you also want to have something in there. So if somebody says, but I'm falling, do I live? That's yes. going to be important, right? Might be a little more important. So our, the plan is to try to do stuff that's a simple version of that. And honestly, in the back of my head, I'm thinking that at some point we'll try to do something that's a little bit more realistic based. Mm -hmm. That would be a narrator's kind of product that says, and here's like all the different crazy things that can happen. Here's how you handle this stuff in the game. Right. Okay. But I, we're trying to make it more simple for people for the main book. Sure. So basically a Reed Richards guide to everything sort of idea from like the Saga game when they just answered a lot of questions about the game and brought right, a lot of exactly. rules in after. And I'll tell you here, I'll give you this one for free. You can call it Nick Fury's Guide to Field Tactics. There you there go. You that's, go. That's a gift to you, sir. Um, but uh, yeah, moving on. Christopher says, so you Canada, so you're a fan of Putin then. I would tell, what was that? Christopher wants to know if you're a fan of Putin since you've been to Canada many times. <laughs> exactly. Here we call it Poutine because we're yes, American, and, right? But yes. And you're wrong. I can't yeah, let course. you know. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, you know, obviously I live in Wisconsin, which we're cheese curds of the king. Yeah, we like ours just plain up fried without the gravy, and, you know, but that is the way we do it. So, yes. All right. So, uh, Wisconsin Poutine is the best basically cheese curds the ones that squeak like a little animal when you're chewing them, right? They're just white cheddar, the nice white cheddar that gets squeaky, but it melts exactly. so nice. Yeah. In terms of range, is there going to be a pass to make kiting less powerful for lower levels? Kite? <laughs> Not sure what kiting is. Yeah, I'm, Paul, I'm going to have to ask you to re-ask that question because I don't get that one at all. Uh, Stephen Watson says, please just make sure the character write-ups are better edited than Marvel's first in-house attempt after Saga, which was that Marvel Universe game with the stones. Yes. Oof, oof, oof. Uh, and would you still be revamping characters from the earlier versions of the playtest? Oh, yeah, for sure. All right, uh, Those are the first things we revamp, actually, because changing the characters that we've already built allows us to see how things change when we change the rules, right? Okay. So if we look at it and we say, Spider-Man is like this in rules version 1.0, 1.1 .1 is like this, 1.2 is like this, 1.3 is like this, right? And it shows us how things have changed. Whereas if we come up with different characters, a lot of times we're like, well, that that's a neat character, but 
does that show us how things have changed, right? Can we put them against other people? So a lot of the times we concentrate on the same characters to, to see if the changes we made will work with those characters, right? Then okay. we add in new characters as we go. Um, but yeah, we're definitely going to redo all the characters so that they fit up with the latest rules, wherever the hell they end up being. Okay, fair enough. Uh, Paul says, is there going to be some form of reward system like loot drops or a renown system for players, like a popularity thing or a cachet, something where they, they'll get better and people will recognize them more for the heroics they do? I don't have any plans for that. Uh, I don't think it's a bad idea. But, uh, you know, again, it's not something that you get replicated in the comics, at least Marvel comics, very well, right? Yeah, it's only I mean, bad press. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, like, Spider-Man is not beloved no matter what, you know, what time, no matter how much he does, right? The yeah. X-Men, again, not beloved no matter how much they do. Even, you know, the current X-Men stories are about how they're actually, you know, saving half the planet. They're immortal, but people still hate them, right? There you go. Um, there notoriety you go. might be a way to do it as opposed to popularity. Sure. Because certainly that can have some effects. But uh, again, we're trying to make that kind of stuff more narrative so that however you want to play the game, if you want to do it, it's fine. We don't want to get bogged down in things like experience points, right? Yeah. Uh, exp for one, uh, superhero games are generally not about leveling up, right? And you might have seen that there was some of that in the original uh, rules where there was like 25 different ranks. There was ways to jump up, up, up. And this, we're more thinking about the ranks being something that tell you what what class of a power that you're in, right? Mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. in, in the X-Men, they always talk about you're an Omega level mutant, right? That might sure. be like, like a rank seven or eight or whatever, um, you know, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, but you don't level up to that. It's something you just have. You learn how mm -hmm. to use it better, mm -hmm. but you don't actually suddenly jump up in power most of the time. Sometimes you get characters that respect. I mean, Captain Marvel's yeah. has gone through several different ways to do that. And, yeah. you know, ideally we'll have some rules for that kind of stuff too. But mm -hmm. uh, that's more of a narrative thing too, right? Something happens in the, in the course of a game, the, the, narrative, and the player says, man, I really want to try this new version of the character. And the narrator says, sure, why the hell not? Just remake them from scratch. We'll do a whole new set of powers with them that are maybe kind of related. And you come up with a reason why we're good. Right. Yeah, and it's usually a story beat, right? Yeah, it's not about knocking down doors, killing orcs, and taking their loot. You know? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, Chris says, does Marvel that you know of have a character generator for us players that love to create our own? I think he's talking about a costume maker or something like that. Oh, and this is something oh. we talked about on the Four Color Cafe talking with the Superhero Roundtable where we talked about how there's this market waiting for someone to step in to make a 3D character modeling software like the old creator wrestler stuff from the old WWE games sure. where you can just make your own character online. No, City of Heroes did that really well yes. too. And I, I play with that forever, right? Oh yeah. Um, I don't think Marvel has any plans for that. I would love to see it. I've got all sorts of crazy ideas that you know, we'll see if they ever get implemented. But um, you know, honestly, at this point, I just want one that actually adds up everything for me so I have to do the math every time. So, um, <laughs> yeah, me, me too. Because, I mean, when you guys are making characters, you're making a couple at a time, but I'm making dozens at a time, and it gets... To a, be a couple of, of a couple yeah. of times, dude. I'm I'm statting out an entire universe when I do okay, it. Trust you're doing me. A lot, I'm, yeah. I'm there with you. you. Know it's like, I did a, a D and D book once that had 20 20th level wizards in it, and by the time you're doing 20th level wizards in D and D, it takes you about a half a day for each one set of stats. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Right? And I don't want that to be the case for doing these kind of things. So we're so that's one of the reasons we slim down the rules for character creation as much as we can. Um, but I still want an app that allows us to do that. We've been having a lot of different conversations with that with different uh, digital partners about how you can pull that kind of stuff off. Oh, cool, if cool, that's cool. what you're talking about. I, I assume that's what he's talking about. Uh, kiting has come up now with a definition, which means keeping players at range longer than the movement speeds currently available. So basically, is there going to be some sort of, in the maneuvers, will there be something where you keep them pinned down at a distance? You can't let them get close to you. Say, like a Punisher-type character is trying to keep the guy from getting too close. To right, you. so you like in a keep... first-person shooter, we just back up while you're shooting the entire time? Or just idea? laying down fire that re reduces right. their movement or something like right. that. Right, I mean, there are some rules, and the, there are some powers, actually, in the uh, in the um, gun powers that allow you to do that. There's a suppressive firepower. Uh, there's some of the rally powers that allow you to knock people around, stuff like that. Um, if it's something we thought was common enough, we should certainly can come up with just a maneuver to do that kind of a thing, right? Sure. Yeah. Uh, if you got, if you have a, uh, if your questioner there has a better explanation for that, wants to write it down and submit it, I'd be happy to take a look at it. Yeah. Flag it and say, Matt asked for this. And yeah, we'll Paul. Yeah. Me. So Paul, if you're hearing what he just said, if you got a better definition of what you want to look at or more of a suggestion of how it could work, maybe write Matt asked and then put the answer to the question in. Nick H is trying to become my best friend. He says, Howard, the duck's guide to the galaxy would be a cool book. And oh, you're right. 
because Howard the Duck is the greatest character ever, and he's already Nick already brought up Alpha Flight. So Nick, stop trying to be my best friend, man. <laughs> um, all right, Steven says the original set of MSH had a sidebar plunder wages of sin for villains, which brings up a good question: Is there a possibility we might see a villain perspective supplement down the road, where you've been playing as a Marvel hero, now maybe take a chance of being a Marvel villain? I don't think we're ever going to see something where Marvel is pushing people to play villains. To be honest with you, right? true. Uh, Disney might not like that. Yeah. Now they might do something where you can play anti-heroes, right? Okay. And we certainly do have some stuff that's going to be going on with that. Um, part of the karma system in the game, the karma only goes to people who are being heroic, right? And as we're changing the traits and tags and such, traits tags are going to be this new kind of trait that basically you can have as many of them as you want. There's no limit on them, but they're narrative only, right? They yeah. don't actually affect the mechanics much at all. But one of some of them will have minor uh, mechanical effects. Like for instance, if you have the heroic tag, if you're somebody mm -hmm. who just generally does not kill people, tries to you know follow the law, all that kind of stuff, then uh, you get karma, right? Sure. If you don't do those things, if you're somebody who's willing to kill like the Punisher, for instance, who's an anti-hero, or Venom in many of his different versions, you're an anti-hero, you don't get karma. You may be fighting with the good guys. You may be fighting on their side, but you're still not going to get the karma that helps you out because you're not doing things that are earning that. Ooh. Right? And same with villains. I mean, it, it may be that villains actually get, they can earn karma in the middle of a play session, but then don't get any to regenerate. Like if you're a hero, you get a certain amount of karma that's equal to your rank. Yep. And every day when you wake up, that regenerates back to that level. Yep. Right. But if you're a villain, you never get any, but maybe if you've done a few good things, you can get some karma and then blow it. But if you don't do anything, but the next day it just goes away. Okay. That makes sense. I like that. That's actually if a great you're idea. You're a villainous person anyway, so you're not going to be able to have any stored but you can earn points in the, in the short term. Right? Temporary karma. Yeah. Okay, Dak Vesser, I was wondering how the experience leveling up will work now. So as Matt already addressed, there will be no leveling. There will be no experience, as it were. It'll have to be a narration thing using a story beat, which is way more like the comics anyway, right? right? Now, we will have some guides for that in the in the narrative section of the book, or the narrator section of the book, saying, like, if you have people want to do a uh, a rookie and bring them all the way up to cosmic level, this is how you do it. In fact, the original... Uh, the the cataclysm, cataclysm of Kang. I got to learn how to say that really well because I'm going to be saying it a lot. Um, the Cataclysm of Kang is going to be a, a book that actually allows you to take your character from rookie all the way up to cosmic level if you have your original characters. It's basically going to be five or six different level, or I think six different adventures, one for each rank, and it'll give you some pre-made characters you can play through that, and you can do one shots for each one of them. Or if you want to, you can take your character and run them through all of them until they're up to that level. We're also okay. going to have some rules for... Uh, using equipment that basically ranks you up, right? So, okay. for instance, if you're Spider-Man and you end up with the Iron Spider armor, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you end up with the weapons from the War of the Realms, or if you end up with Thor's hammer, these are things that actually rank you up in power, but they're temporary things. And by the time the adventure is over, they go back and you go back, you reset your natural level of power, right? That's interesting. Okay. I like that. I like that. Uh, Nightcrawler with a Javelin anti-tank launcher. Thank you, Stephen Watson. That's adorable. Uh, he wants a Thunderbolts book as well. I think we all do, Me but too. I'm I'm old school. I want the original it's just, Thunderbolts. It's going to be part of Phase 4 or 5 or whatever the heck it is. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, Paul says, Matt asked about kiting or range slowing footing. What I was intending was asking if there could be a look at the range of powers to make lower levels less likely to get pinned down by gunners. Ah, okay. Hmm. I don't know why a lower level should be less likely to be pinned down by a gutter. Yeah. Why would I, that be? Yeah, Paul, I'm going to ask you to come. I know we're driving you crazy, but I ask you to keep clarifying, uh, but come back with some more clarifications. I mean, it seems like a higher clarify. level character would be less likely to be pinned down by a gutter than a lower level. So maybe I'm just misinterpreting the question. Maybe it could be. Matt, what's your favorite character you generated for the new system so far? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Hmm, that is a good question. I think the new Shang-Chi uh, is really kind of neat, right? I think the way that he works is, and that's why I just did from 1.2, so that's probably the reason that he's my favorite character at the moment, because I just did him, right? Uh, I'm sorry, Shang-Chi as a... As yes, a, I, I know. Yeah. It's, and I grew up saying Shang-Chi, right? Because, right? you know, that's because you don't know. Then Shang-Chi. Um, but, uh, that, you know, my favorite characters of all time are Spider-Man, uh, who I grew up loving when I was a kid. And I wrote a whole book about Captain America. And by the time I was done with that, I wrote that for DK Publishing as a kind of an encyclopedia for Cap. Uh, by the time I was done with that, I was absolutely in love with Captain America too. And all the different ramifications and permutations of Cap. It's an so. amazing character. Paul continues, but also have options at high levels to pin enemies down and route to play with movement strengths. More about balancing. 
Got you. So you're talking more about tactical balancing, right? There is some of that stuff in the gunplay uh, powers, and we might be refining that a little bit more. Um, I don't think that's going to be a, a major part of the game because, again, uh, that's more of a – if you're doing a World War II setting with Captain America, that makes a lot of sense, right? Sure. But in your standard Marvel superhero setting, not so much, right? Yeah, Spider-Man's going to swing right in and not even be worried about the gunfire. Yeah. Uh, Brent Brooks, welcome aboard, says, will we have different versions of Iron Man armor that change range and or powers for Tony? I'm sorry, rank and or powers <clears throat> for Tony. That's a good question. Uh, I, what we're trying to do is we're going to try to do, hit the main versions of the characters, the current versions of the characters right now as they stand. Uh, but a lot of these characters have evolved over the years, right? So um, eventually I'd love to do one that features the original Avengers at their current at their power levels back in Avengers issue one or issue five awesome. when Cap shows up or whatever, that would be right? Awesome. Um, or maybe we do a golden age source book for the you know the guys from the 1940s and, and such. Um, but you know, we're gonna have to see how it goes. Those are not gonna be the top priority, obviously, right? right. First, you know, rather than doing Iron Man Mark Armor 1 through 45, we're probably <laughs> going to do whatever the latest one happens to be and then do a version of Captain America and whatever all the way through. And then when we feel like we started filling that out a little bit, then we'll be able to do those other things. Of course, if we go back and if we do an Avengers book, it would be great to have a section that says, these are the original Avengers. These are the ones from the 70s. These are the ones from the 80s it's, and go through. That would be a chance for us to focus on those a little bit more, right? Okay. Or even if, you know, by some... Uh, grace of God, we actually managed to do a whole Iron Man book at once. And yeah, I'll do every Iron Man armor ever done and all the war machine ones and all the other buddies and all the robots and all the androids, but, and all the enemies who stole Stark technology that led to exactly, armor wars. Right? Come yeah, on. And the armor wars all over again. But man, can you tell it just suddenly turned to dark on my, on yeah, my it was also <laughs> like, as we start getting into armor wars, yeah. everything gets dark. dark. <laughs> oh, right? The nineties. Oh no. Night mode kicked in um, on my screen here. Um, so yeah, yeah, I'd love to do all that stuff, but obviously it has to be balanced off against things that are are, are uh, that other people are excited about for other types of characters too. Absolutely, Tim says, will there be a system for inventing things and building things like Reed Richards or Iron Man does that type of thing? So gadgeteering essentially or inventing. You know, I have banged my head against that kind of problem for years and years, and it's not a simple problem to solve, right? I think it's uh, we could certainly give you some guidelines for that uh, use of powers that allow you to do one offs. Right. Mm -hmm. Like I think when we do the super genius powers, there's probably going to be something that says one off, one off solution. Right. Right. This is the one thing you need to invent for the solution. But it's also going to have to be more narrative than uh, than combat oriented, because it's the kind of thing you don't do in the middle of a combat usually. Right. It's like, OK, you guys go buy Reed Richards some time or Tony Stark some time sure. or comes up with this and then pulls it out. And it, suddenly you got the ultimate nullifier that you managed to find that's going to take out Galactus, right? Exactly. So, so yeah, bashing. definitely that kind of stuff fits thematically, but it's not the kind of it's it's got to be more narrative than than strictly uh, combat based, right? And then strictly rule based that way. Okay. Ken and Ann ask, with the understanding that the characters will change and refine during the playtest, was there a reason Captain Marvel and Thor do not have some sort of damage reduction, say like Asgardian durability? Yes and no. Yes is uh, one of the reasons we wanted to test out, see what would happen if we just gave them shitloads of, of health points. Sure. As opposed to damage reduction, right? Now, as guardians, because they're higher density, probably should have some kind of damage reduction. Okay. And that will come along as we as we take a look at the other characters. Part of what uh, we're doing when we come out with characters to play test is we're not, these are not meant to be the final characters. Like you might have noticed that uh, Wolverine came in as a rank three and then Sabretooth came in as a rank four. Um, obviously, they should be pretty equal to each other. Right. But uh, because we're trying to play around, okay, should we make them a rank three or a rank four? When we come out with Wolverine, we're like, let's see if that works. Okay. That maybe let's see if a saber tooth works in rank four. Then we'll probably rank them both up to rank fours or down to rank three, depending on how it works. Okay. Uh, and then we'll also, you know, we're testing out things like, do we want more damage reduction or do we just want boatloads of health points for these guys? Right. Or do they need more focus for the different things you're doing? That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a uh, health points and a focus point economy too. There's a lot of this kind of stuff you have to think about when you're, you're developing all these things, you know, especially as we were uh, messing around with the damage system about how it was going to work. You know, originally it was it worked uh, by dice rolls, and now it's a multiplication on your Marvel die, which is a lot simpler to do, but and it's actually more swingy than the old way you did. I mean, it's, instead of just having this one bracket of about 18 points you can do in, which tends to go down to fairly small, it gives you quite a range you can do damage in then damage reduction becomes more important at that point too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Uh, Steven Watson says X-Men first class Cyclops, Iceman, Angel, Beast, and Marvel Girl versus X-Factor Cyclops, Iceman, Angel, Beast, Green, yeah. and Gray. Would you have them at different rank builds to represent experience? That's a good question. I certainly would uh, hit them with a lot of different tags and traits that would show that they had uh, matured, right? Okay. Now, the rough powers are probably going to be about the same, although you might hit them like one rank lower to show that they are not actually as skilled as they could be, right? Sure. Sure. Um, but with the understanding that they would rank up and max out at whatever rank it was, probably three or four, from, depending on what character it is. Probably okay. four for most of the X-Men, right? Right. Um, and then, like, you know, the Omega-level mutants are probably more like rank five, you know, and then uh, you, you work that out there. So, yeah, you certainly could rank them down low. I wouldn't put them as low as, like, rank one. That's going to be like when Professor X just discovers them and they've just got their powers, you know, like as Cyclops is being tossed out of the plane and with the parachute with his uh, and his parents disappear, being stolen by sure. um, by aliens. So, <laughs> um, spoiler, but, yeah, yeah. Sorry if you guys don't know that. That's been out for thirty years or so. But, um, a little bit more, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, it'll work that way. I think you could do that, but it's uh, it's it's a judgment call more than anything else. Right? Okay. Stephen Heller talks about gadget rules. We just covered gadget rules. There'll be some guidance for narrators on that. There may be some stuff, but it wouldn't be instantaneous during combat. It'd be more narrative and behind the scenes or time killer. So that's fine. Uh, Armor Wars 2 Electric Boogaloo. Nick, stop. We're not going to be best friends, man. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm stoked to see the redesign of energy powers with the removal of damage types. Any sneak peeks available, i.e. with energy absorption. Uh, there might be something I can't give you any sneak peeks about that kind of stuff, but honestly, that was just something where I got tired of saying you're immune to this, but not this, this, and this. And it was, you know, how many different types of ways can you slice damage? Again, that's something that's probably better handled narratively. You'd say you're you're sure. uh, immune to this, but you're not immune to gamma radiation, right? Yeah. But you know, do you really do you need to have that kind of finely defined thing for every character, right? Uh, it got very tedious very quickly. And I know D and D does this kind of stuff. I understand that, but uh, this needs to be less of a, uh, a point by point combat simulation and more of a fun thing. Uh, you know, so that was the reason we ditched a lot of those kind of things. Like, is it slashing or piercing? Do you really care which way Wolverine got you? <laughs> it's, it's not D and D. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, totally. I get that. Okay, will you ever do a deck of cards or for power sets so you can have a quick reference instead of constantly looking in the rule book? I would love that, but I think it's more likely you're going to see a digital set that'll do that, right? Uh, what'll happen, and what I do when I when I do character sheets for demos, is you get a uh, you select the power, it pops over, and it fills in a little like two line description of the thing. Probably not the whole thing, but just enough so that if you read the stuff before, it'll remind you of everything you need to know, right? And if you're doing a digital version, you can obviously just hit a link; it'll bring you right to the original power. But I like okay. to do things. The, the character sheets can be redesigned from the ground up as well. Obviously, uh, the Batwing display that we had in the first thing, that's all gone because we're ditching a lot of those kind of numbers. Yes. So it's only going to go in one direction. Uh, I'm going to probably put all the powers on the second page so that the first page has got lots of space to deal with everything else. And then when you're looking for the powers, you just turn go, turn to your second page or turn to the backside, and there are all your powers right there in one place as opposed to having to go back and forth. There you go. Yanice Dorian, welcome aboard, says, can't wait to see how Rogue's power stealing works. Yeah, me too. There's some really screwy powers out there. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and those are going to have to be some things that, uh, you know, it might be that uh, instead of having a power set for certain powers, you just get a power, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, there are some characters that magnify powers or some characters that steal powers. There's kind of these meta powers as opposed to actual uh, sets of powers that they're they're welding, right? So that's going to be some interesting things to deal with. I'm not sure we're going to deal with that in the first book, to be honest with you, because that's the kind of stuff that tends to uh, it tends to mess with everything else, right? So for Rogue, we'll obviously give her the powers that she stole from Captain Marvel, right? And then we'll have to have some way for her to steal other powers. It might be as simple as just having one power as opposed to a power set, though, right? Yes. I like that, but I like that you had frameworks and then you had individual powers as well. Yeah. Though I would suggest all the framework powers should be available as individuals, but that's just me because I like the Lego build if I'm going to do that. Yeah, exactly. And if you want to play it that way, go ahead. Nobody's stopping you. Exactly. Right. It's, it's, I, I understand that, that kind of annoys people sometimes when a game designer says, play it the way you want because <laughs> they want to know how they're doing it right. People yes, want to know what the right way is. The answer is there's not a right way. We're trying to give you best practices. We're yes. trying to give you the thing that we think is going to be most fun for you. But on the other hand, we don't know every one of you, and we can't possibly tailor it to every one of you. 
So part of the narrator's job and part of the player's job is to figure out what works best for them and throw out the parts that don't, right? So basically, if you decide to do that in your own game, Matt promises he's not going to come to your house and slap the game at No, no. I, I, and my philosophy is if you're having fun at your table, you're doing it right. I don't care what you're doing. Even if you're cursing my name every other sentence, as long as you're having fun, you're doing it right. Uh, Brant Brooks says, Matt Forbick does know his comic books. This game is in good hands. And Tim agrees, and I agree yeah. as well. Uh, with the new system, is there going to be a Marvel screen for youngage GM? So young GMs, will there be basically a, are you guys looking at putting out a narrator screen? We are, uh, we're looking at that. We have, we're in discussions with various people about that. There are going to be some uh, licenses announced for ancillary products that are going to be coming out, but that's not quite ready yet. So you'll see more stuff about that in the future. Okay. Stephen Watson says narrative option for gadgeteering. If allowed to be done off panel, time is figured in weeks and months, years based on complexity and prototyping, kit bashing collapses the time frame for an adventure. Sure. Yeah, that's kit generally the right idea. Exactly. Yeah, the kit bash creates a one-off prototype that serves as inspiration for future permanent builds. Exactly. And that's yep. that's a great way to go. Okay, so now before the book comes out. We're going to hopefully see some more updates or at least one more good update that'll take us towards where we want to be, right? With the feedback still coming in. Any chance we're going to see maybe a scenario or two that we can use for play testing? Maybe. I mean, what we're really trying to concentrate on, the the one scenario we have, which is really honestly a very thin scenario, is yep. basically to put people in a room and have them beat the crap out of each other. Yep. Right? And that's what we need them to do for a play test, right? So we're probably not going to see another scenario for the next update. Now, when, and honestly, there's not going to be a scenario in the main in the core rulebook when it comes out because one of the things about putting scenarios in core rulebooks is that you know it takes up a lot of space for something that's used once by and maybe read by one person who's the narrator, right, mm -hmm. in, the, in your playgroup. However, the big thick adventure book is coming out one month later, right? Yes. So you will have a lot of adventures, or you'll have six new adventures you can play with. That'll be for each different rank all the way up. Right. Okay, and they'll also be available as VTT options, right? Virtual yes, tabletop. well, that's the plan, obviously. You know, we're still working with our partners on that to make sure everybody's lined up, but uh, hopefully we'll still be working with DemiPlan and Roll20, and you guys will have those options to add those in as well. Any chance, uh, much like uh, Free League has done and Pathfinder Paizo has done, any chance we'll see Foundry VTT support as well coming? You know, that's really up to Marvel, and it's really uh -huh. up to the Foundry guys. I mean, it's a license thing, right? So uh -huh. um, if, uh, if the Foundry guys show up and say, We'd like to do this, then yeah, maybe we can do it. On the other hand, if the Roll20 guys show up and say, we want this as an exclusive and we're prepared to pay for it, then that's a different thing. Businesses, right? businesses. Okay. Uh, for the purpose of balancing uh, during play test, should damage reducing powers be ignored currently? Use what's there. Right. Uh, if you have damage reducing, uh, if you have damage reduction, use it and see if it works. Right. Um, I would just try it, fiddle with it a little bit. It may, it may be that the damage reduction is too powerful. The damage reduction in the original set was often too powerful because characters could not actually damage anything. Right. Then part of that was because the damage was bracketed so tightly yeah. that you couldn't swing past it. So even if you got a really good hit. It didn't matter, right? Yeah. The way the damage works now, especially if you do uh, a Marvel result and you get double damage, you can usually get past any kind of damage reduction, at least a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So do us a favor and test that out and see how it's working for you. There you go. And then go leave feedback, please. Yeah. And if you uh, discover that it needs to be like double damage reduction, tell us that, right? That's okay. There you go. Uh, I would recommend a generic story inspired by the Blues Brothers to test low levels. Oh, dear God. You got, you got a flat yes. car, it's <laughs> dark, you're wearing sunglasses, and you're heading to Genosha. Yeah, it's uh, one, of my, one of my favorite movies of all time. I live just north of Chicago, so yeah. Well, there you go. So. Uh, will you be covering Shape Changing? It's one of those ad powers, too. It is. That's more of a power that you can do different things with. There's probably going to be a shape-shifting power set, and it'll involve things like uh, it, it might come under plasticity too, right? It might be a refined version of plasticity, which is already a power that we have um, for that Groot uses, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. But whereas Groot and Mr. Fantastic used to stretch things, shape shifting might be changing your shape uh, instead of elongating or whatever to uh, from one shape to another. Like if you're going to become a werewolf or if you're just changing your face, you can disguise yourself, right? There are a lot of different ways to interpret these things. Absolutely. You know, again, it becomes, do we do a big umbrella that fits a lot of these types of things, or do we just uh, make them as separate powers? So we'll have to figure that out. Uh, just to comment, love the focus damage aspect. I would love it if there were more focus status effects. 
Yes, that's going to be coming more with the uh, as we get into doing the magic and the psionic stuff, right? If we as we get into doing telekinesis, telepathy, all that kind of stuff, you're going to see more of that. Stephen says uh, Bluesmobile is a kit bash because it falls apart at the end. There you go. Uh, and Stephen, other Stephen says it's 106 miles to Chicago. We got a full tank of gas, half a pack of cigarettes, and someone just pissed off the Hulk. Hit it. <laughs> so there we go. Perfect. Actually, I think it'd be She Hulk because Carrie Fisher would be the one that would be chasing them at that point in time, right? <laughs> yeah. So Carrie Fisher is She Hulk. Exactly. Uh, okay. So now, is there a long term plan? in place for publishing or is it just get the first two out see what happens and go from there there is a long-term ish plan right ish. Uh, like uh we've got stuff that hasn't been announced that we're looking at for at least the next year or two right? okay and uh ideally we're going to keep going beyond that right one of the great things about doing the marvel play test is not only was it a great way to test the game with players but it was also a great way for marvel to get their feet wet with this because this is a sure. new market for marvel Right. So for them to be able to step up and say, this sounds interesting, but is it really going to make us money? Is it worth the effort? All that kind of stuff. The sales on the playtest core uh, playtest rule book were very strong and it gives Marvel a lot of faith in the fact that this is something we can keep doing for years and years and years. Right. Okay. And like everything else in the world, especially Marvel, which is a periodical company, essentially. Right. Yeah. At least the comic books are, you know, if sales trail off at a certain point, they'll probably say, mm, that's, it was fun, but now we're done. Yeah, right? It's been swell, but the swelling's gone down. But, uh, you know, if the game does well and when it sells well and everybody's happy with it, there's no reason to think it won't continue for years and years and years. Right? Any yeah. any chance there'll be some sort of publishing agreement for people to produce their own modules and stuff like that? Or is I that too complicated? That's probably too complicated for Marvel. And Marvel's very tight with their intellectual property. Right? Yes, they are. Um, and for good reasons. And, um, you know, they it's not like Dungeons and Dragons where all the characters are your own characters. Right. Sure. So if you if we allow people or Marvel allows people, I mean, really not my choice, but Marvel allows people to suddenly say, OK, we're going to do Captain America, but as this horrible thing over here. Right. Mm -hmm. And and Marvel has no approval rights over that because it's just set out there for people to do. That becomes a problem for them. That becomes a problem for their lawyers and for branding and all that kind of stuff. So, sure. Uh, I suspect we're not going to see something like that. I, now, on the other hand, I know that you know nothing's going to stop every every player on the Internet from kit bashing any kind of characters they want to. Right. Expect to see lots of DC conversions. Exactly, right? And I, I'm all for that, right? I, I don't see that there's going to be a way for people to legally put that out and monetize it, right? Yeah. Uh, now, now, if we can now, come up with a great strategy for us to pull that off, I am all ears and be happy to pitch that to Marvel. But Well, pitch. why not pitch them the idea of, okay, thank you, Beans. It's lovely. I appreciate <laughs> all of this. Uh, why not have something that's basically, you need to go down. Bye. Um, why not have something where they can make their own adventures with their own characters using the system, but not Marvel properties? That might be something that would work, right? And that's something that, uh, you know, I've talked about using the system for other types of games and other types of properties, whatever. When we get to that point, that might be something to be willing to open up. Open up the system, but not the Marvel universe. Exactly, because, I mean, listen, I'll be honest, I'd love to be able to put some of the Zenith characters out in that system. Just yeah, saying. Exactly. I mean, that's what I was doing on the side anyway, building my own universe of characters out for the fun time. Hulk smash. Oh, look at the kitty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, he, and he's back, by the way. His brother's sleeping somewhere, but here goes the tail. There we go. <laughs> okay, Beans, no, buddy, no, not the time, sir. Not the time. <laughs> He's obsessed with the bookshelf now. It's he's I don't got blame. There's a lot of good to, stuff in that bookshelf. Yes, he wants to go play DC Heroes and Marvel Superheroes and Bash and all the other games. He wants to have fun. Will there be any power set cooperative abilities like Repulsor Blast Off Cap Shield? So yeah, will there, will there be a power stunt system? That is going to be stuff that we're going to talk about under maneuvers. Like I said, like if you're going to do the fastball special and things like that, right? Uh, there's going to be a rough system for for using your actions to team up with other characters getting very specific about things while it's fun and can be splashy and we might do it for certain adventures and things like that. Um, it can get very, if I start coming up with every combination of different powers you can do with everybody, you could do entire books just on that alone. Sure. Right? And that doesn't seem like a really good use of time to be honest yeah. with you. Um, now having a system where people can come up with their own on the fly and make things happen and then have to describe them in detail and make everybody at the table laugh and, and cheer. I am all for that. Sure. I mean, and if you have some sort of maneuver system where they can come up with maneuvers on the fly and there's just a little mechanic option for it, you know, it'll be great. People people yeah. are going to do their own maneuvers anyway. Are you really? This is just normally you don't want to be here when we do yeah. this, but right now. The you... idea is that the mechanics encourage that kind of thing for people. Well, exactly. So this works, but only if you describe it in the narrator says, yeah, that sounds awesome, right? So. Okay. 
Tim says, uh, we don't need the JLA. We have the Squadron Supreme. Which version, Tim? Yeah. Which version? Grunwald's version? The Brusik's version? The Supreme Power? Uh, J. Michael Straczynski version? Trust me, you're talking about my favorite Marvel <laughs> team right now. Uh, and Chris says, was there any chance we could see a box set? For the new system i would love one it's not gonna be something that comes out right away maybe uh maybe in the future right because okay. i uh, i think first again marvel wants to get their the uh, game out the door get people involved and then at that point once we get everybody you know, all our hardcore gamers involved i would love to have a box set that was out for younger players that would teach them how to play uh you know a starter a set gift, basically essentially, right so so like a starter set exactly with a Knight of the Octopus type adventure in it. Perfect. Exactly. Now, I don't have any control over that, but, you know, yeah, it's been pitched and we'll see what happens. Okay, fair enough. Dark Ves Dak Vesser says, what was the thought process on getting rid of the easy actions just because various other RPGs tend to have three types of, like 5e, a move, an action, and a bonus action? So, Again, we were trying to uh, slim the game down, essentially. Right? Uh, from going from 1.0 to 1.1, 1.2, mostly it was a matter of streamlining the game and saying, does this need to be here or has it become tedious, right? I mean, for instance, uh, I understand why there are encumbrance rules in Dungeons and Dragons, right, in early editions, but man, are they boring to actually have to deal with, right? Mm -hmm. So we are steering away from things that are just, the idea is to cut the boring parts of the game away. Okay. Right? So if they're boring, if they get tedious, if they become bothersome, if they become annoying, then we try to slice that away. Now, some people like encumbrance rules. And in fact, you can go out and play video games where they're all entirely about encumbrance rules, right? Where they take that one aspect of the game and just focus on it. And it becomes really intriguing, right? Yeah. But uh, again, I don't want this to be, this is going to be a game that we're, we're going to focus on simplicity as opposed to building out every possible subsystem that might work for something. Right? Okay. So can when it came to that, it was just a matter of saying, you know, easy actions, uh, do we really want people having to sit there and think, is this an easy action or not? Or is it, is it a simple action, an easy action, or an action? Yeah. Right. Like, well, let's just make it moving and any other kind of action, essentially. Yeah. So. Uh, no, I think the bringing it down to a move, an action, and what's the other one? Uh, a reaction, right? A re reaction. You know, a reaction the is just an action you can use in your off when it's not your turn. Was ongoing? What was the one that was ongoing action? Concentration. Concentration, yeah. yeah. So that's, you know, you got four choices there and everything else yeah. is a free action. Concentration isn't really an action. It's more of a duration, right? Yeah. But as long as you're able to do that, and then uh, because we eliminated easy actions, you don't have to worry about, am I using my easy action to enforce my concentration this time? How are you right. handling super speed? Ken and Ann are curious. Oh, Jesus Christ. Don't ask me that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, super speed is going to be fun. Um, it's the, it, the question is, does it break everything, right? There are certain powers you have to really look at to see if they break everything. Some of the psionic powers I'm a little bit worried about too, the telekinesis, you know, the telepathy, whatever. Yeah. Um, sometimes if you look in the comics, the only thing that keeps these things from breaking everything is the morals of the characters that have them. Oh, baby, yeah. Right? Uh, and if there aren't any, then it gets really messy very quickly. So, oh, yeah. um, and how you build that mechanically to make sure that, People just don't decide that it's just, I'm going to reach in your head and turn off parts of your brain that allow you to breathe. Things oh, like yeah. that. Right? Well, I mean, and ultimately at the end of the day, I, I, for me, as a design philosophy, I know like something we've run into with the heroic and bastard sword is that the people say, well, what happens if they want to do this? What if they want to say that? Well, that's the DM or the GM's call. Yeah. That's that's we can't account in game design for every possible thought a player is going to have at a table because I guarantee you there'll always be a player who says something that makes the GM's mouth go and they <laughs> go, what? And honestly, that's the selling point of role-playing games, right? Tabletop yeah. games, right? This is stuff that a computer game can't do for you, right? Uh, it's, it allows you to use your own innovation, your own storytelling skills, everything else, to come up with solutions on the fly that seem right for you and your friends, right? Mm -hmm. And we want to provide the framework for that so you feel like you're confident about it, so you know how it's going to work and all that. But again, we can't build out every possible uh, permutation of that. It would take forever, and it's really not worth everybody's time. Right? And the book would be this thick. It would be it'd that be thick. Insane. I mean, you, uh, I would fill up this entire office with just pages, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's got to be, you got to have, so the tools are there for the narrator to do what they need to do to make rulings on the fly, which is a great thing. Uh, will Wong, will Wongers be having a cameo in the game? God, I sure hope so, man. He's become one of my favorite characters, right? Oh, so. my God. Okay, listen, I don't like She-Hulk, but uh, the Madison Wonger thing is, I, I ship them now. I love it. I yeah, think they're, they're the greatest fun. thing ever. Uh, I like limiting the speed of characters in MSH as the team has to be able to hear each other or else the speedster runs alone. Communication is a thing, a.k.a. Ask, ask NASA. 
Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Well, that's one way to help limit things, right? Super and speed actually, is a huge thing. One point two is we reduce the uh, the speed of a lot of characters, saying this is a combat speed. If you're running flat out or, doing, or flying flat out, then yeah, you can go you know five, ten times as fast. But while you're in combat, where you actually have to have situational awareness and realize that yeah. things are going on, it slows you down a bit. Right. Yeah, I uh, when I was running, I was running a bash game a few years ago, and it was the game session that made me stop wanting to play bash. Was one of my buddies was playing a speedster, and he so abused it in the combat. I just went, "Well, you just broke the game, man." Well, yeah, done. yeah. And that's you, the trick. you want to make it so the power there's not one power that just makes it no fun anymore, right? Well, exactly. Or that suddenly there's no reason to have any power but that one. Right. Yeah, counterspell in 5e. Uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, that came out wrong. Uh, please, no time traveling for speedsters <laughs> like yeah. like in the other guys' DC Flash. Chris, shh, you're not allowed <laughs> to talk about that because you play in my campaigns. Um, I like speedsters who move, so I, I don't know what that means, Tim, but thank you for sharing. Uh, okay, so now, here's the next question. Are you going to be doing, or is there a plan to do, or a discussion to do, a different set of character profiles based on comics and MCU? That is not, we're currently focusing only on comics. Okay. Right? Now, there's a possibility to do MCU at some point, but that's really not up to me. Fair enough. Fair enough. What is the one book you would most love to produce for this game if you had your druthers? Well, I mean, the core rule book was what I'm doing. <laughs> Beyond the core rule book, <laughs> fancy pants. Uh, I tell you, I'm really excited about doing a Spider Verse one because I'm such a big Spider Man fan. So we need one, and I'll tell you why we need one because we almost had it for Saga, and then Saga collapsed before it came out. And to me, that was the greatest crime of Saga is that that book was written mm. and ready to go and yeah. never came to the market. Oh, which I hate that broke one my one. heart. Yeah. Now I have with, uh, with the Mar Margaret Weiss edition too. There are a number of books that were in the pipeline that didn't yeah. come out. You're like, oh, all the effort and all the fun that could be had. Now, what about event books? We're not going to do event books as far as I know. We might, if something comes up, we say this is going to fit. Problem with doing event books is, is twofold. Um, one is that the, you want them timed to the event, which is often a trick to pull off, right? And two is if uh, – a lot of times when you're doing adventures, you want this to be something the character can do on their own and explore on their own. But if they've already read through the event and know how it goes, then that's less fun for them, right? They don't want to be going down a railroad that says, this is how it's supposed to happen. We're sure. going to see if it goes different ways. You want to give them something they can just play as opposed to saying, well, now we're going to do Civil War and the heroes have all been outlawed. And are you going with Cap or are you going with Iron Man? Yeah. You know, um, and I think it can be fun, but, you know, because we got so much more freedom in this edition that we can do these kind of things, I think that uh, I'd rather not restrict people to those, right? Okay. You see that D&D &D has really walked away from that kind of stuff over the years, too. D&D &D doesn't do stuff that uh, follows the Forgotten Realms history all that much or the even Dragonlance or whatever, any of these kind of things. Uh, in the 90s, we did a lot of this stuff in role-playing games where you know, there was a meta plot that followed along, yeah. right? Yep. And nowadays we're like, you know what? We're just going to come up with plots and let the characters do whatever the heck the players and the and the narrators do whatever the heck they want at home, right? Yeah, that's one of the reasons every and it's stated like this in the rules. Every game that you play, every campaign you play in is its own uh, Marvel universe, right? Mm -hmm. You you know you can assign it whatever uh, mythical number you want to have on your own, and if you move your character from one guy's universe to another uh, narrator's universe, that's just like you know Miles Morales popping from one to the other, right? It's okay. You can do these kind of things, um, but we don't want to dictate to you how things happen in your Marvel universe. Six one six, the dice mechanic. It's a bit confusing. People got a little confused by the yeah. six and the one and the one. Now there's two sixes on the die, and what's going on? Any thoughts about making it if it comes up with the Marvel result or a one on a regular D six? If you don't have to have fancy pants Marvel dice, it just explodes. It becomes a six, and then roll it again and add the next result to it. You know, um, I've thought about it. I'm probably not going to happen just because at the moment, if you get a Marvel result, it does double damage, and that's a lot of damage already. Oh, yeah, right? sure, for damage, yeah. But no. for the same, just for, like, success rate. Right. I think because of the fact you can manipulate the Marvel dice to get a... You can manipulate the dice, right, through edges and troubles through and other environment and, and everything yeah. else. That increases the chance of exploding, which I think would start to make it even more ridiculous at a certain point. You, you mean like in a superhero comic yeah that's true that's true right yeah, that's, <laughs> that's that's fair i can totally understand i mean if somebody wants to try that out and see if it works and let me know go for it fair, fair enough. enough there you go play test and put a result yeah. back in yes by the way webs did come out for uh marvel phase rip so that's the only marvel game so far that's had a spider-verse book there you go. 
Uh, will the book include a Thanos copter and a Spider-Mobile? Nick, now we're not friends because that was the silliest question ever. And also, I want to see Luke Cage show up and demand his money from Doom in the game, at least. <laughs> you you got to put that in a book somewhere, just that there Thanos you. thing of him. I want my money, sucker. Um, do, 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 do. MSH didn't. It was the last book, sort of. Well, webs came out. Um, this may not be the appropriate forum, but does Marvel have any particular position on live plays since it's their IP, i.e. streams, YouTube videos, et cetera? Not yet. Uh, that is something we've been discussing. Um, okay. I think that you're going to see a lot of live plays happen, whether they're official or not. Right? Absolutely. I'm going to do one. The question is, does Disney send lawyers after them? I hope not. But I really know, hope you know, not, too. I'm not part of their legal department, so I don't know. I would uh, really I would hate that. To see an official one, too, and we'll see if we can pull some of that stuff off. That said, if I did get a cease and desist for a live stream from Marvel, I guarantee you there would be an immediate YouTube video I would do showing off the letter and dissecting it in detail because that would be wall. awesome. Yes. <laughs> uh, Christopher says, what about a magic universe like, the, like, for example, the old Realms of Magic book? Will there be a source book for magic possibly? I, we're going to have a basic system for magic that comes out in the core rule book, right? And, but on the other hand, magic is something that's got so many different permutations where there, I'm trying to avoid doing other books that add on total bits of mechanics, right? Sure. But for something like magic, I could certainly see it happen, right? Okay. I can't tell you whether or not it's going to happen, but it's certainly in the back of my head that that might be something we could expand upon enough. If we did something like that, it might be a strange Academy book, for instance. Ooh. Like Ooh. Uh, is, Steven, you know, all sorts of different schools of magic in it. So, yeah. There you go. Stephen Watson's continuing the everybody has a Christmas list now of books they want to see you put out. Damage control. Will there be a damage control book? <laughs> No, I don't know if there's going to be a book for damage control. I, I think we'll have them in some of the things, but whether or not they uh, are worthy of having an entire book dedicated to them, I'm not sure. Most of the books we're looking at putting out are like 256 page hardcovers, right? Sure. Uh, so you're, you're not going to probably see a whole lot of smaller stuff. Uh, again, because the amount of effort that goes into these things, uh, it's usually not worth the time to put out, you know, 32 page stuff. Although you might see some stuff in that, in that range as well. So we we discuss different things all the time. And I, you know, well, I, one, I can't tell you. Two, I don't know. <laughs> so. Crazy idea. I'm just going to throw this at you. Um, back when DC had the AD&D comic license and did their AD&D mm -hmm. comic, in the back of every issue, they had stats yep. for second edition of all the stuff that was in the comic. Is there any thoughts from Marvel about maybe saying, hey, you know what, instead of doing an entire source book on something, we had this character appear in this comic, we'll throw in a page at the back that has his stats for our game as well. I would love that. Uh, the idea has been brought up. No idea if it'll ever happen. Okay, but it's been brought up. That's great. Matt, are you really a Doctor Strange variant attempting to spread Marvel throughout this universe as well? Shh. Yeah. Shh. <laughs> you don't want to cause an incursion. Stop. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you don't want to see the alternate versions of me or Matt. They're not good. They're very bad. Mm. <laughs> uh, just I was just piggybacking on Damage Crawl, Luke Page demanding payment for Doctor Doom. Yes, you were, sir. I love Strange Academy. Not going to ask for a book on it. What is Strange Academy? I'm tuned out of the current. It's a uh, uh, title. It's uh, God. Who are the writers? And the, Scotty Young is involved with it. It's really fun, right? Uh, but it's basically young Marvel uh, magic-based characters being taught by like Doctor Voodoo and Doctor Strange and Wong and whatever uh, okay. about how to use their magical powers properly. It's set in New Orleans. Uh, it's a fun title actually right okay. so it's kind of like a uh, harry potter in the magic in the marvel universe but with you know a lot of darker attitudes to it one of the characters is the son of dormammu for instance and uh, mm. you know there's all sorts of other really fun characters and i like it a lot it's, and you know the the writing and the and the art is fantastic well i'll tell you something i've been doing ever since this game came out is i've been going back and revisiting marvel comics that i love and rereading them and all that kind of stuff and having fun because i know i'm going to eventually do some videos about building characters as the game comes out and the two things i've been basing a lot of that on and reading on that is um, ultimate universe specifically ultimate spider-man and then the mc2 universe which was tom defalco's ultimate universe yeah. which is really funny because i reread all the spider girl i read the reread the entire in order mc2 universe which is amazing and then i'm rereading ultimate spider-man and it's amazing how much tom defalco and brian michael bendis were telling the same story from two completely different versions of storytelling yep. in that bendis is darker and it's angstier and mc2 spider girl is very you know oh, gee golly shucks <laughs> you know what Brain i mean Chinese, yeah Oh, it's really interesting. But like, some of the story points are like down to like characters that appear are like, oh, that's that version of this character. And I'm talking about incidental background characters. I'm not talking about villains. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. Uh, will there be any team mechanics as minor boons, like being part of the Avengers gives the mentor trait or something like that? 
there's going to be something where uh, if you're part of a, a part of a team that allows you to use certain maneuvers, right? Okay. So, uh, for instance, if you, it doesn't even matter which team you're part of usually, right? I mean, there might be some that are specific to a team, but uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're part of the Avengers or you're part of S.H.I.E.L.D. or you're whatever, because you train with these people, you're allowed to use certain maneuvers that, uh, that only team members could use, right? Okay. So, for instance, if you're trying to do um, a fastball special, even if you're not one of the X-Men, but if you're the Avengers and you're a team that is trained together, then you can pull something like that off, right? But if you're just individual characters who are playing and haven't actually worked with each other, you're not going to be able to pull that off. Okay. Okay. Steve Watson wants to know, will you be setting up maps based on the game scale? So we see, so first of all, the map guy you guys got is amazing. Oh yeah. Brian is fantastic. And, and I'm not going to lie. We're trying to get a hold of him to see if we can commission some stuff from him for Zenith because his maps are. Yeah, he's great. Um, but, uh, is there, are we going to see maybe some more maps, uh, some more battles? Well, there's certainly going to be more maps in the adventure when that comes out. Right. Uh, so you'll see more of that kind of stuff. Uh, whether or not we produce them as, uh, you know, posters and stuff like that is another thing entirely. It depends on, you know, the demands of the product and how they look and what they yeah. fit and all that. Uh, when we were doing demos at Comic-Con, actually CJ Cervantes, who's the uh, project lead on this actually went and, uh, printed out each floor of the map on, uh, from the uh, yeah from the playtest rulebook, printed it out on a big mouse mat, right? Yeah. So they're like a neoprene. They just rolled out. They're fantastic. Ones. Yeah, I saw that. I remember you seeing that. And I remember saying, if they're giving them out at Gen Con, get me one. And I don't yeah. see any flying around my house, so yeah, obviously yeah, yeah. I'm not getting one. I don't even uh, have one myself. I mean, that, that's ah, oh, that's yeah. a crime. Well, for the neoprene ones, there was only the ones that CJ printed up for the demos, right? So he'll bring them to wherever the heck we end up running them at. There uh, then there are the big paper ones. And I, when I was at Comic-Con, I didn't grab them. I should have, I should have grabbed yeah, them. Yeah, hey, breaking my heart there, Matt. Yeah. Uh, any chance, instead of books, we could see source material as a uh, website, like downloads, characters and things like yeah, that? Yeah, there might be some stuff like that. And there might be, particularly with our digital partners, uh, doing some stuff like that. All that's still early in talks, and we don't really know exactly what it might be. Um... Paul says, who is the best X-Man and why Nightcrawler? Ha! Well, I think you answered your own question there. As, as a recovering Catholic myself, I'm very into Nightcrawler. So, it's like, oh. um, uh, so yeah, I like Nightcrawler a lot. He's a lot of fun. Uh, Wolverine is one of my favorites from way back just because he's got such a great patter, right? Just the, the attitude and everything else. Um, there are lots and lots. You know, there, there's an X-Man for every, anybody, for everybody, right? Pre-Sage uh, no Perilous what. Rogue for me, man. Pre-Sage Perilous Rogue for me. The classic villain redemption. Uh, how is the art chosen? I'm ancient, says Ken and Anne. And I'm assuming that's Ken, since there's no way Anne would say she's ancient. Uh, how is the art chosen? I'm ancient and would love some classic Kirby at least once. That's a good point. Um, the art is chosen by myself and our editor, Brian Overton. And then we have our uh, our layout person, uh, Simeon Cogswell, who also uh, chips in stuff occasionally. So uh, basically, when I'm going through a chapter, I'm writing stuff. Part of my job is to come up as to turn over an art suggestion list, mm -hmm. and I say I'd like this, this, and this. If I have a lot of time, I'll pick something out exactly that I want and go back in Marvel Unlimited and say it's in this issue on this page in this panel, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'll send them a, a screenshot of it, whatever. Sometimes I'm like, well, I need the Invisible Woman protecting people. And mm -hmm. then Brian will come up with one and say, this is, you know, we know I can, a lot of these guys who work at Marvel have been doing this stuff for decades and they know what the heck they're doing. It's oh, like, a huge back hockey, catalog. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, Kirby's one of my favorite artists of all time. So if I, anytime I can sneak in some Kirby stuff, I'm happy to. There you go. Paul says also, if we're running an X-Men game, how many minutes should we wait before they're resurrected inevitably? I would say not in the middle of combat. Right? <laughs> Usually, it, even in uh, Krakoa, it takes a while to, you know, you have to hatch the egg and do the transference and all that kind of stuff. So it would be like, you know, uh, a, it's probably longer than a long rest from Dungeons and Dragons at least, right? So, Are we going to see more origins in the final product? Yeah, definitely, right? Uh, okay. We're going to go through and, uh, and try to build out as many of those as we can, backstory stuff for origins and alien races and all this kind of stuff. I mean, with all the secret invasion stuff, you're going to see some scroll stuff, you know, whatever. Um, so we're going to try to hit all that stuff as much as we can. Again, because it's a Marvel universe, there are so many dozens of different things. We probably won't be able to hit everything, but we are going to try to make it a fairly broad uh, and broad and deep as, as we, far as we can. We actually have it plotted out how many pages we have set aside for every section of the book. Right. Okay. So once we hit that point, we'll say, did we do enough here? 
And if we did enough, then we'll say, good. If we think we need, we absolutely need more, we'll steal sections from another part of the book or we'll add pages if we have to. Okay. So now that's actually she... what we did with the play test book. Originally the play test book was going to be 48 pages and that was going to be 96 pages and they ended up being 120 pages. So. There we go. Uh, Steven says, uh, would suggest golden age masterworks, volume, silver age, bronze age, etc., allowing you to follow focus characters on artists to, Depictions. I also tie that into the idea about source books because I would love to see an Ultimate Universe source book, obviously, yeah. just to have those characters, and then you could use the art. So, is there plans or at least discussion about doing source books about specific eras or universes? Well, at the moment, it's all up near, right? Okay. And again, obviously, I can't announce anything; it's too early for that kind of stuff. But um, you know, there have been some thoughts about would you do uh, you know an Ultimate book? Sure, uh, could you do something like that? But our main focus at the moment is going to be on modern Marvel comics, right? Sure. Not going too far back for anything or whatever. If we end up doing uh, bigger books, we can certainly look at doing that stuff. But, uh, you know, we're trying to fit more of a, of a fifth edition model of product release as opposed to uh, the first and second edition Dungeons and Dragons, where there was like dozens of things that came out every month. Right. right. We want to do a, a smaller number of really high quality, amazing things as opposed to flooding people with stuff. Makes sense. Because the problem sense. is if you do that kind of thing, and we saw this, if you read Benjamin Riggs has got a book out right now called Slaying the Dragon about the fall of TSR and how it fell apart, right? And one of the main things is that they put out so many different products that just basically uh, shattered the market to the point where, you know, if even if you were a big uh, big Dungeons and Dragons fan, suddenly you became a Dark Sun fan or uh, one section of Dark Sun as opposed to, you know, or a Planescape fan or uh, yeah. whatever, as opposed to being a D&D &D fan. Nowadays, you're a D&D &D fan. Yes. Right, as opposed to doing all these other different things. And you can narrow, you know, if you go on the DMs Guild and get to whatever you want to, but from an official company point of view, we don't want you to, to narrow down to one thing. We want you to be a fan of everything we're putting out. Okay. That, that's when, why we sell enough books to keep the line going, to be honest with you. Yes, exactly. Right. Buy the books. You want more stuff? Buy the books. Yeah. Show Marvel it's worth it for them. Exactly. Uh, 1.3, possibly next month? That's the hope. Yeah, that's what we're projecting. Okay. Any chance for old Marvel stats like the old, uh, you know, uh, remarkable Biff Bam Zoink, uh, you know, any of that fun stuff? Yeah, there, there's certainly a possibility for that kind of stuff. Uh, I don't think it'll happen in the core rule book, but you know, further on down the line, when we feel like we have a little bit more space to play with things, yep. certainly can do stuff like that. Okay. Irving Forbush will have to do stats for it at some point, you know, whatever else. So. Jason says, any plans or projects after Marvel? Will we ever see Brave New World Second Edition? Man, have you watched yes. any of the times he's been on here? We bring this up every time he's here. Um, definitely. I actually have the rights back to Brave New World now. So uh, there is something going to be happening with that. I don't know exactly what it is yet, and I can't really announce anything. But I will say that the reason I haven't put anything out for it since I got the rights back in like 2018, 2019 is because I started working on the Marvel game. And I didn't think it was fair to Marvel and to myself to be working on two superhero games at the same time. That would be true. Right. Uh, I get put all your heart in one thing and then you move on to the other thing after that. So exactly. I, I split my time between two projects that I'm working on. When I get burnt out on one, I pick up the other one for a while. Yeah. Uh, but again, two competing projects like superheroes would be bad. And it would be, it would be, in, it would be. Well, then you bad. start thinking, am I going to swap, swipe this mechanic for this? Or am I going to use it over yeah. here? Or is it yeah. differentiated enough? And, you know, I work on tons of different stuff at the same time. I mean, I'm uh, working on video games, novels, comic books, you know, all sorts of different games. But uh, doing something that was, you know, that close to each other, I just didn't feel comfortable with. I'm sorry, did you say you're writing comic books now, Matt? Well, I haven't written any comic books for a while. Uh, the last comic books I did were like from Magic the Gathering several years ago. So it's been a while mm. since I've done them. But I did we're a year's gonna... with Magic the Gathering for IDW back in the day. We might talk one day. Um, source books would be a good option before the MCU reaches the Secret Invasion series. <laughs> Since the feedback on the Marvel site is quite structured, are there other means of providing feedback and suggestions or plans to provide something more open forum? I would say the best way to do it is through that and just you know click through every other thing and don't pay attention to it and then get to the part where there's the open field and say, this is what I really want to say in big, bold type. And then put it there, right? Okay. Uh, there is no other way at the moment. That's not to say that we shouldn't have it. 
especially once the core rule book comes out and we're not going to be surveying people so much about it. Uh, it would be nice to have a way for people to get feedback. Again, part of the reason is because uh, legal wants to make sure that anything that is given to us as an idea is given freely, yes. as opposed to somebody saying, "I, you stole this idea from me. Where's my yes. money? Now, we all know that gamers don't generally do that. It's really, really rare because we tend to be a very giving people because we're excited about it. and We want to share our ideas with the world. But you know, Hollywood lawyers don't understand that kind of film thing. industry. I've had, yeah. and now listen, I've worked in the film industry since 1987, and yeah. I have literally had people go, Would you mind reading my script? And I've had to look them dead in the face and go, No, I can't. Yeah. And then have to explain to them, even if subconsciously I take one of your ideas, I'm opening myself up to litigation, or if I do exactly. something similar, it's yeah. just I can't look at it ever. Yeah. Uh, are there going to be, sorry, any new powers in the works? Says oh, Joe. Boatloads, right? Boatloads. Um, Part of what we're going to do is we go through, we figure out all the different characters are going to make. Then we have to figure out all the powers that they have. And then we come up with the power sets for them. And a lot of times that actually says, and then we need to have these other characters. So it tends to be a, a reinforcing cycle that way. Okay. Yeah, George uh, George Spelvin says, all you need is one gamer to ruin it. Oh, he's not even a gamer. You just need one person and they can ruin the whole show. So you got to be careful with that. That's NDAs are life in the publishing world. They just have to be. And it's the one the Marvel has is that, you know, you say, hey, if you put a comment or you make a suggestion, you're giving it to us freely. It's the best way to go. People then can yeah. choose not to do stuff, but they remove that litigation risk. Um, now, I have a question that I want to phrase properly okay. you've got the cataclysm of kang mm -hmm. six adventures right yep zero to hero in the entire run of the game how does that work <laughs> how do you go from street thug to cosmic well we're what's really going to happen is you're going to have six different adventures that you can play with uh included characters that we're going to give you Right. Mm -hmm. And some of those will be new characters that are not in the main book. And some of them will be say, well, you know, if you need Dr. Strange for this one, go grab Dr. Strange out of the other book. Right. Yeah. And we'll have all the villains that are in the book that you can play against. You don't have to play with the same characters in every adventure. If you remember the original Marvel superheroes game, every time an adventure came out, you played a different group of people. Yes, you did. Now you had the option to play whatever you wanted to. And you, you certainly do with our stuff too. Um, but one of the sections of the book, there'll be another chapter and it says, if you want to play with original characters and bring them all the way up from, uh, you know, origin story to cosmic power level, this is how you do it. If you want to stop them at this rank here, but still want them to play in the rest of the stuff, these are the devices we suggest you use or things like this that you can come up with that allow you, like I was talking before about how we can have uh, different uh, tools that allow you to rank up temporarily and then go back to your, your natural state. I think that's a great idea, by the way. So you'll have that kind of a thing that's available to you in the game. So if your natural power rank is a four for your character most of the time, but you want to fight in this rank six adventure, then you will be able to have some access to some tools that allow you to do that that will then disappear at the end of that. Okay. Right? So that'll be another chapter that's in the book. That's actually already in the outline. Yeah, now I wanted to talk to you about something that was a giant pet peeve bone in my soup about uh, the original playtest rules, which I did sure. not see corrected in 1.2. The idea of having different ranked characters working together and then suggesting, well, those the lower guys can go over there and deal with the goons while the We, Matt, you've been role-playing for how long? Uh, most of your life. Me too. We know damn well the Hawkeye players can be like, no, I'm going after Thanos. No, Hawkeye, yeah. we really need you to go take it. I'm going after Thanos. I don't care. So will there be some sort of karma mechanic or something like something that um, I think um, City of Heroes is a great example is that when you team up with a higher level group, your ranks go up because you're fighting those things. And when someone higher exemplars, their stuff goes down. Not fun in a game at a table to yeah, to try Maybe. to pull off that mathematically in this game would be yeah. Owner. What about a what about a karma mechanic or something that the lower level guys get more karma while they're fighting with the higher level guys? There could be something like that. Uh, I'm definitely looking at all sorts of different ideas for it. Sure. Um, you know, part of the easy thing you can do is you can start doing maneuvers where you know the guys who are more high power can be lending aid to the guys who are lower power, so they can actually feel like they're doing something right. Okay. And, and also, of course, you can always uh, there's already mechanics in there for the people who are lower power doing stuff to give uh, extra edges to the players that are, you know, the, on the front lines. Right. So there's ways to do that, but of course you want to make it a little bit more colorful than that, a little bit more exciting than that. So that'll be under the maneuvers kind of section. for that. Okay, cool. Cool. So uh, yeah, I definitely think there's, there's a lot of uh, interesting areas to be about there. I'm not sure it's going to be a karma mechanic so much as an edge mechanic, but mechanically they're, they're fairly similar. Right. Yeah. So. 
Uh, we house ruled that uh, karma let you uh, explode a die or something, and it made the karma more valuable at that point in time for us. It was just something we did to make it more exciting. Yeah, one thing we added to 1.2 is that karma actually allows you to come back from death essentially, or from being knocked out, right? Yeah, so, sure. Um, so in a way that wasn't available before, because, you know, as I was playing with people, I'm like, somebody gets knocked out, they're like, oh, I'm just screwed. I'm like, well, yeah, yeah that's not fun. So let's have a mechanic in here, or if you've saved a karma point and you're ready to use it, or somebody wants to come over and spend one on you, you can actually make a rule to give yourself some extra health points, or whatever you need. Sure. To focus, and then come back and get back in the game. Yeah, there was, a, there was a game, and I will never remember what game it was, there was a game, I, and this is going back, where the mechanic was that you could spend this hero point at the after taking a massive amount of damage to go, oh, no, it looked worse than it was. I'm actually okay. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, I've seen that in movies, you know? So, yeah. like, that made sense. Uh, Street Tug the Cosmic, well, I guess it's the Sentry, the April Fool's Day character that never went away. Stephen Watson, read Dark Avengers. Sentry is awesome in Dark Avengers. You actually will get a new respect for that character, and if you don't, well, nothing I can do for you. Paul, are you going to be joining the con circuit after publication so we can get our playtest books signed by the author? Sure. Uh, I don't do every convention in the world. Uh, I go out to conventions where people fly me out, essentially, or if Marvel brings me out. Um, so that for them, that's usually things like New York Comic Con, which I'm not going to do this year, but I'll probably do next year. Uh, San Diego Comic Con, C2E2, things like that. Bigger conventions for comics, right? I always had Gen Con. I always had a lot of local conventions around me, like uh, Game Hole Con and Nexus Game Fair and Gary Con, stuff like that. Uh, I was a guest out at Kubla Con earlier this year. Oh, wow. Out in San Francisco, too. Okay. So if somebody wants to fly me out and I have the time, I'm happy to do that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to be sitting in a booth flogging the game at every convention that comes along. You could do that every weekend of the year, right? Absolutely. Um, but for this, I my time is better spent actually coming up with more uh, material than it is sitting in a booth for a lot of the time. So, Fair enough. But All yeah, right. I'm not shy. You'll be able to find me. <laughs> Uh, so he wants to know if you said Dark Va Dak Vassar wants to know will you see at the UK Games Expo in Birmingham any I, I haven't been back to the UK in 30 years 32 years now I actually worked for Games Workshop when I was fresh out of college in 1989-90 and after six months left I had a work visa at my student work visa ran out my girlfriend asked me to come back that's not my wife of thir of 30 years so it worked out pretty well but um, but I've not been back to the UK since so one of these days I would like to get back I'm actually going over to Sweden later this month to work on a video game for somebody. So I've oh, done nice. a lot of traveling. I've been all around the world working on different things, but for some reason, I've never been back to the UK. Uh, any chance the game will have rules for subplot stuff like romances, since we're talking about girlfriends in Sweden versus wives of 30 years type situation, or girlfriends in, yeah, we're in the UK. Yeah, yeah. Um, is there any chance we'll see some of that stuff added in as mechanical stuff, social mechanics, things like that? I subplots. don't know that we're going to focus too much on that, to be honest with you. You haven't seen too much of it so far. Uh, I think a lot of that is down to narratives. And again, it's one of those things that I while I see a lot of that being possible in comics, what I would like to do is at some point is a genre book that allows you to do all sorts of different things, right? Sure. Like this is the horror genre book. This is the science fiction genre book. This is the romance genre book, whatever. Um, it, but you're right. Comic books, especially like the X-Men, whatever, often have a lot of soap opera subplots. and Spider-Man. Spider-Man's ton of them, right? Dear God, the entire modus operandi of the Marvel Universe is how hard can we make Peter's life? I exactly. mean, Jesus right. Christ. So there's certainly going to be some stuff about that that's advice in the narrator section about how to do that. Sure. Whether or not we're going to do that mechanically and teach people how to uh, tilt the system one way or the other, I don't know that we're going to have enough space to do that in the core world, to be honest. Okay. Christopher, this will be the last question, guys, and we're going to wrap it up with Matt. Let him get on with his life. And I'm yeah, I got to go pick up a kid from college here tonight still. So. There you go. <laughs> Christopher wants to know, is there any non-Marvel comic character you wished was a Marvel comic book character just so you could stick him in the game? All of them, man. I mean, yeah, Indiana Jones, man. I put him in the game in a heartbeat, right? So. Gem and the Holograms. And I'm not even kidding. There you I'm, go. Not even, I'm not even being ironic on that. Yeah. Gem and the Holograms belong in the Marvel Universe as the cool band that everybody goes instead of Lila Cheney and all that exactly. nonsense. All right, listen, anything you want to tell us about anything upcoming, any appearances we need to know about, anything at all? Uh, as far as the Marvel stuff, I'll, I'll show you this stuff here because I got it right behind me. But my son and I, Marty, who's actually helped me out with some of the characters for the Marvel role playing game, we did this shotguns and sorcery stuff that we just did a Kickstarter for that we're just back in November and we're fulfilling it. If you guys want to order a copy, uh, the 
uh, online store for that is still open for last second pre-orders, but then I think we're still going to start shipping stuff out next week. So if you want to get in on that, we're not selling that at uh, in retail. It's just going okay. direct to uh, consumers. Once I run out of the co uh, copies I have here, which I'll probably put up on eBay or whatever else after this, um, then it's done. We're going to be doing print on demand through drive through RPG, but okay. the deluxe version, which is this, which has got like a leatherette and gold stamp mm -hmm. and edges and ribbons and all this other kind of stuff. Schmexy. Uh, they're gone. They're gone. So, all right. And they can find that on Kickstarter, right? To get the pre order. Yeah. If you go to Kickstarter or if you go to shotgunsnsorcery.com, that'll take you right to the pre order page. There you go. All right. Well, listen, thanks everybody who showed up for the chat and asked questions. It was a lot of fun. Matt, yeah. as always, a pleasure to have you here. And when your schedule lightens up, we're going to do another four color cafe and get a bunch of jabbering gamer geeks again. Always a pleasure to have you on those as well. Hopefully, we can get Shane once life gets a little bit calmer year. for him to come back yeah, to. Yeah, you've had a rough year. Uh, it's been not good, but we're not going to get into that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, listen, always a pleasure to have you here, sir. Same always here. a pleasure to talk. And uh, for everybody else, thank you so much for coming out. I am the Forever DM Bear to my friends and enemies saying peace, love, geek. And as of tonight, we are always going to say, make mine marvel. See you yeah. next time.